Hello everyone. So today we are doing MRCP paces, the management of type 2 diabetes. Okay, we are talking about oral hypoglycemic agents specifically. So I have done another video on diabetes uh, earlier on in the channel by the name of Diabetes Crucial Concepts, which I'm going to link it up right here for you to check out. Make sure you have a look because I cover lots of good material in there. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Vishal Kumar. I set up this channel and also keenmedic.com where you can find the PACES course and also my book, first of many. So let's get started. So in this video, this is what we're going to be covering. We're going to be talking about the oral agents only. Okay. Now, diabetes and its management is absolutely enormous. So there is no way that I can cover every single aspect of diabetes management in a single video. Okay. I'm not going to be touching on insulin or things like GLP-1 analogs uh, because they've got some very specific criteria and there are many, many regimes of insulin that you can use based on a person's needs, their targets, their uh, monitoring uh, capabilities, everything and uh, all these factors. Okay. So I'm not going to touch on insulin on this uh, in this video. We're going to then move on to talking about special considerations for the oral agents that we use in type 2 diabetes. And these special considerations will be things like hypoglycemia, obesity, poor renal function, and also the common side effects that you need to be aware of. The whole point of PACES is that you need to be a general medical registrar, okay? You don't need to become an endocrinologist. You don't need to be a diabetologist when you are uh, performing in your exam in PACES, right? So there are certain crucial concepts that you need to know, the core concepts, okay? You don't need to know all the ins and outs of every single uh, management uh, strategy, all the agents, etc. You don't need to be um, up to date with the latest and latest uh, of agents that might be in trials, things like that. You really don't, okay? You don't need to know about every single insulin that is out there. You need to know about all the common insulins, absolutely, you do. But you don't need to know about all the, all the many dozens of insulins that are out there, okay? So that's what I want to say to you. Right, let's get started. So the guidelines now are from NICE 2015, okay, National Institute of Clinical Health and Ex Excellence in the UK. So NICE are an organization in the UK that um, issue guidelines for clinicians to follow uh, all around the country. And you should be familiar with the NICE guidelines for pretty much all conditions, okay, including type 2 diabetes. The latest guidelines were issued in 2015, and that's what this video is based on. The paces will also uh, be based on um, the NICE guidelines because NICE guidelines are used all around uh, the UK. Okay, so make sure you familiarize yourself with it. We'll be going through most of it in this video anyway. So the guidelines at the moment, uh, in addition to using oral hypoglycemic agents, talk about um, other things that you should be doing with the patient, okay? And these are things like uh, looking at their diet, what they're eating, okay? Uh, looking at their risk factor management. So these are cardiovascular risk factors, as you can see, blood pressure, smoking, lipids and cholesterol, and their weight. So targeting these uh, risk factors as well as their diabetes control, their sugar control, okay? Not just the uh, sugar control because there is no good uh, doing just the sugar control if they have got hypertension, are a smoker, have got a cholesterol of six and are morbidly obese. There is no point because they are going to be um, loaded with risk factors for cardiovascular disease, okay? Education for the patient is fundamental uh, in managing their diabetes because you only see the patient uh, every now and then, right? So you only see a snapshot of them. When they go away from your clinic, from your ward in the hospital, they have their own lives to lead. So 
educating them about how to manage diabetes is absolutely crucial, which is why programs like Desmond exist in the UK. And you can refer them to the program where they can be educated on diabetes and its management. Let's now look at the NICE guidelines for the oral hypoglycemic agents. Now, this is a very busy slide, right? So much text. Look at all of this. So, Let's not try and read all of this right now. I like to make things simple, okay? So I'm a simple man, I like to make things simple, and I hope that you find this approach useful, okay? So let's not try and read all of this, let's move on. I'm going to simplify it for you. So for everyone, you need to put them on metformin. It's as simple as that, okay? If a person has got type two diabetes and it is poorly controlled, they need to go on metformin, that's it. Then, what happens then? If they're on metformin now, what do you do? If their target HbA1c is still not achieved, by the way, you should uh, try and remember the HbA1c targets from the slide earlier on where I showed you the NICE guidelines. Again, you can download it uh, from NICE um, or you can uh, take a screenshot from my video, which, whatever you please, uh, or make notes. Okay, So if they don't achieve the level of HbA1c uh, that you are targeting with the metformin alone, what do you do? You start them on dual therapy. You, s what, uh, you give them metformin plus any one of these agents, sulfonylureas like liplazide, which is the most commonly used here, uh, DPP4 inhibitors like linagliptin or cetagliptin, or thiazolidated ions. Try saying that fast, uh, like pioglitazone, which is the most commonly used one, or the more recent newer agents, SGLT2 inhibitors, SGLT2 inhibitors, as they are also called, like dapagliflozin or ampagliflozin. So it's quite simple if you think about it. So basically, so far what we've covered is that anyone with type 2 diabetes with NHPA1C not in target should go on metformin, right? Immediately. Then you recheck their metformin. Uh, then you recheck their HPA1C three to six months down the line. If it is still not within the target that you want, then you think about dual therapy, okay? So dual therapy is simple. You put them on metformin and add any one of these guys, all right? So what happens if the HbA1c is still not in target? Well, it's pretty simple. You guessed it, triple therapy. That's it. So metformin plus whatever you chose earlier, plus whatever is the next best option among the same lot of medications, okay? So these are the key ones that I want you to remember uh, because there are loads of others that you don't necessarily need to know about, okay? So these are the key ones that you have to remember. Make sure you know all about these agents. So it's quite simple, right? So, so far, we've talked about how to manage type 2 diabetes. That's it, really. That's the ins and outs of type 2 diabetes management from an oral agent point of view, okay? With regards to other agents, there are GLP-1 analogs and meglitonides. And, of course, there is insulin. Reason why I'm not going to cover these guys is because, uh, first of all, you don't really see many patients with GLP-1 analogs or meglitonides. You really don't. M vast majority of patients are not on these agents. The thing about insulin is that it is a topic in its own right. Okay, uh, People spend years trying to perfect um, insulin and its regime. While the principles of it are simple, there are there are several regimes and there are dozens of insulins out there that you can use. So it is beyond the scope of this video. However, we said that we are going to be talking about some special considerations. So let's do that. So let's talk about the most important one, which is hypoglycemia. Okay. So obviously, when you are trying to lower a patient's blood glucose with the aim of trying to achieve good diabetic control, the risk is that it may shoot the other way and you might do um, an overkill, so to speak, okay? 
so their blood sugar might drop to dangerous levels and you need to be very very cautious with this you need to know exactly which agents cause it and what are the chances of this happening okay so glyphosate is one of them it is well known for causing hypoglycemia it is not suited for a lot of patients for this reason so a lot of elderly patients who might for example live on their own uh, or even might have dementia for example and don't have hypoglycemia awareness are not suited for uh, glycolazide, for instance, okay? Uh, pa patients who drive uh, large cars like lorries uh, and have had a history of hypoglycemia are not suited for glycolazide at all, okay? Because that is extremely dangerous for them. Insulin is the other obvious one. If you uh, have patients who don't know how to calculate their doses or accidentally take uh, more insulin than necessary or... Um, are eating less, etc., then it can easily cause hypoglycemia as well. Okay? So be aware of these. The other thing is that meglitinides, which are rarer agents that you won't really see, can also cause hypoglycemia that you should just be aware of. But again, as I said, you won't really see this much. Obese patients, you will see lots of them in your practice, in on the ward, and potentially in your exams as well. So you should think about what agents might help with the weight control as well. Okay, so you want to uh, prioritize agents that will help with the diabetes sugar control in the long run, but also help them lose weight potentially. Okay, so these agents should be preferred, and these agents include metformin, our good old friend metformin, which Literally, everyone should be on, right? So metformin and the other agents are GLP-1 analogs. Again, which I said earlier, you don't really see much. So this is slightly beyond the scope of this video because uh, as a medical registrar who is not working in endocrine, you won't be starting someone on GLP-1 analogs, okay? You just won't do that. Um, it would be endocrinologists who start patients on GLP-1 analogs. Poor renal function is a day-to-day -day, uh, reality that you have to deal with, okay? As a medical registrar, as um, a registrar who uh, is on call or on the ward. So you need to uh, be aware of the agents that need to be avoided or you need to be aware of the dose reduction that need to take place when a patient has got poor renal function. Now, the definition of poor renal function varies when it comes to diabetes um, oral agents. But overall, what we are going to assume for the purposes for the video is we're going to use the EGFR of less than 30 to define poor renal function. Okay, So if a patient has got EGFR of less than 30, there are three agents that I want you to remember that you need to avoid. Okay, Three agents. The first one is metformin, right? So the commonest use drug of all by far but you need to avoid if a patient has got poor renal function. This is the BNF recommendation. Uh, speaking of the BNF, all the medications that I have used uh, to refer to in this uh, poor renal function uh, slide are all based on the recommendations of the BNF. Okay, So it is all up to date and official. The other agents are the S include two inhibitors, the flozins, the dapagliflozins and empagliflozin, because the exclude two inhibitors uh, work on the kidneys. So you need to be very careful of patients who are on these and stop them immediately if they are on these medications and have got renal uh, dysfunction. Okay, And the only agent that you should really think about for dose reduction is cetagliptin if the patient has got poor renal function. And as for the others, like uh, glycolazide, pyoglitazone, and linagliptin, apparently no adjustment is needed. So, you know, you can just kind of let them be. However, if uh, you're not sure, you should always say that you are going to seek the um, official opinion of the endocrine team. Okay, so the one advice I would give you for PACES is that never take, never take risk. Okay, if you are not sure about something and you can't have immediate access to a reference, to a, re to a reliable reference source, then always say that you would seek advice from the relevant team. OK, so if you forget any of this for any reason in your exam, then just say you would uh, seek advice from the BNF 
and also the endocrine team. It's as simple as that, guys. Okay, so I hope I hope that makes sense. Let's talk about the common side effects then. So uh, we will cover the same medications we've covered so far. These are the side effects. So metformin, the most common side effect by far is diarrhea. Now, the one thing that you can do is that metformin is commonly started in the immediate release preparation when patients are started on it. Okay, So if patient has got diarrhea, what you can suggest is that, is that they try the slow release preparation because that can often relieve them or help them with the diarrhea symptoms. Okay, uh, Gastrointestinal upset in general can also happen. And there is also a risk. There is also a risk of lactic acidosis, especially in patients who are septic or have renal failure. So, which is why, in patients with renal failure, metformin should be avoided for this reason. All right. Sulfonylureas, as I said earlier on, the single biggest thing you need to know about is hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia. Don't ever forget that. Pyoglitazones, the thiazolidinediones. I know, I've perfected it over the years, what can I say? So these guys, there are three main things that you need to be aware of, but the one thing that you realistically have to aware, that you realistically have to be aware of from a day-to-day -day usage point of view is of heart failure, because you will get elderly patients on these agents, and if they've got fluid overload, heart failure, then you should be stopping these agents and put them, putting, and put them on something different, okay? There is also the risk of bladder cancer long-term and also osteoporosis. Esoglut 2 inhibitors, the newer agents, the empagliflozin and dapagliflozin, can cause uh, urinary tract infections, which can be recurrent and have been known to cause uh, diabetic ketoacidosis as well. Patients can come in with diabetic ketoacidosis to a &E, and if they are on uh, any uh, flozins, uh, esoglut 2 inhibitors, then these should definitely be stopped and these should also be stopped is if a patient has got recurrent urinary tract infections okay and put on um, alternative agents now again as i said earlier remember what i said if you're not sure always seek the opinion of the endocrine team and lastly, uh, are the DPP4 inhibitors, uh, gliptins, which are often very well tolerated, which is why I've put them as the last thing here, because they don't usually cause issues in most patients. And these are the um, most common things that they might cause uh, issues with, okay? So cough, skin reactions, possibly pancreatitis and uh, angioedema. All right, guys, I hope that you found this useful. Let's just talk through a very quick summary of what we've covered today. First and foremost, metformin for all patients with type 2 diabetes where their HbA1c is not within target. Then you move on to dual therapy where you give metformin plus something else. Then you move on to triple therapy where you give metformin plus something else plus something else, okay? If their HbA1c is not within target. Beware of hypoglycemia. This is something you should think about for every patient who presents with hypoglycemia, who presents with hypoglycemia, has had hypoglycemia in the past or uh, has got risk such as lorry drivers. Okay. Consider renal function before starting patients on medications and also review medications and definitely remember the important side effects we've talked about. Okay. Guys, I've got a question for you now. So if you want me to write a book on PACES essentials and templates for examinations and approaches for every single station, then let me know in the comments below. So with essentials, I will be able to uh, cover things like diabetes management, like I've just done. And templates will be things like how to approach uh, stations such as cardiovascular examination, uh, upper limb, cranial nerves, uh, even Parkinson's examination. So if you want me to write a book on all of this, let me know in the comments below, guys. And if you have got any other suggestions, feel free to let me know down below. If you want to learn more, you can always check out my book, which is available in the Kindle format and paperback, and also my course where I do live Q&As every month with my students. The links for both the book and the course will be in the description right down below. I will see you in the next video.